Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Ken Goldberg, who is Professor of Industrial Engineering and Operations Research at UC Berkeley, where he also has an appointment in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Ken is also an artist, and his work has been exhibited all over the world. He is founding director of UC Berkeley's Art, Technology, and Culture Colloquium, and is, in the, as, and is the author of, among other works, uh, a collection called Robot in the Garden, Telerobotics and Telepistemology in the Age of the Internet. Uh, Ken, welcome to our program. Thank you, Harry. Where were you born and raised? Well, I was born in Nigeria, hmm. in a town called Abaddon, and I w my parents were there doing teaching. Uh -huh. So they were at a place called the Mayflower School. And so, so you, were, are you, you have Nigerian citizenship, I guess. No, actually, there was some question about that. But when I turned 18, I think mm -hmm. I was given a choice. And so I decided to go with the USA. Mm -hmm. Looking back, how did uh, your parents shape your thinking about the world? Well, interesting. The, my mother was just visiting. We were, they were very idealistic, which I think is something I've picked up. They also, my father was an engineer. And so he was, when I was young, he was very interested in building things, robots. Uh, he did a very early robot for, hmm. uh, for a company that he owned. And I think that ended up inspiring me to go into robotics. So, so it was actually you were interfacing with the real world that got you interested in all this stuff. Now, I was going to ask you, well, did you read a lot of science fiction? No. You know, my, we have a theory that there's a science fiction gene. <laughs> that uh, you either have it or you don't. And for some reason, I didn't get that gene. Mm -hmm. So what about education? How long were you in Nigeria? or did, did you, Were you educated in the United States before you went to college? Or? Yes. We, we left. I was six months old. Mm -hmm. So we moved to Columbus, Ohio, and then to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Steel mm -hmm. Town. And that's where I grew up. And in, in, in high school, did you have any uh, teachers that really turned you on to uh, science and engineering? Or was your, or was your father enough? Well, it's interesting. I, in, in, uh, at second grade, I had a teacher, Mrs. Ludwig, who was very interested in collecting butterflies. Mm -hmm. So that was a start for me, because I got very, she really got me interested in all kinds of species. and. Be, and I, 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 I cataloged them, I tracked them, and that was, I think that was a start. Mm -hmm. And, and where, where did you do your undergraduate work? University of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. And, and then what, what uh, I, I should ask, because we're going to talk about this later, w were you interested in art during this, this early period in your life also? Did you, did you do any kind of art then? I did. Well, when I was in high school, I took some art classes, and I was interested in trying to find a way to synthesize art and other interests but my family was going through some financial difficulties and they my my they were pretty clear that it was important to get a something that I could rely on for a, a steady income mm -hmm. so they guided me toward engineering and in retrospect I thought it was really it was a good decision mm -hmm. and so then uh, from from undergraduate what what did you major in as an undergraduate so I started as a metallurgist like my father mm -hmm. but I decided I didn't like that very much so I, I migrated over to electrical engineering mm -hmm. and then I spent a year abroad at in Edinburgh and one day I was there they had a fair for new courses and I was wandering around and they had a course on artificial intelligence mm -hmm. And so I took that class and was very interested. And when I came back, I discovered a lab at, at, at UPenn that was specializing in robotics. So that's where I really got interested in that as a, as a research topic. And then on to graduate school, and where did you do your graduate work? At Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And then you finally wound up here at Berkeley. I think you taught, did you teach at the University of Southern California for a while? Yeah. I did. So my first job out of uh, graduate school was uh, USC in 1991. And I stayed there for four years and then received an offer to move up here, and I took it. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you have a multifaceted career, but I would like to help uh, our audience understand what exactly you do. So your, your, your primary profession uh, is as an industrial engineer uh, uh, and a computer scientist. Is that uh, uh, a good definition of what you do. If it is, then tell us what it is exactly you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to be. Uh, I'm still trying to figure that out myself, <laughs> Harry. The uh, it, it my what, sometimes I, I I say it's my day job is mm -hmm. um, is uh, as professor of engineering. So my background was in computer science. That was my PhD, 
And so I moved here and I'm in the industrial engineering uh, department because it has a strong interest in manufacturing, which is a um, very big part of my thesis work and part of my publication record. So we're very interested in problems of robotics, really understanding the geometry of robots and their interactions with the physical world. So we look at things like how does a robot pick up an object or orient an object in space. So there's a lot of beautiful mathematical problems associated with those questions. And that's what my students and I do, I would say, you know, during the daylight hours. And when I was a, it started when I was a grad student, but we started doing painting when I, at night. So I've also had a sort of parallel um, pursuit of artwork. Mm -hmm. But for a long time, I kept them very separate. Mm -hmm. well, let's look at your engineering work. Uh, and could you give us an idea of, of what it takes uh, uh, to, to do this kind of work. I mean, what, what, are, what are the skills involved? Obviously math, mm. uh, uh, quantitative uh, analysis. What else? A lot of patience, I guess? Or <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of similarities, actually, between the, the work that engineers do and the work that humanists and artists do. Ultimately, I think it's about creativity and curiosity. So there's a view of engineers, you know, these kind of monolithically working and solving problems, et cetera. But really, in an academic setting, engineers are, have to be just as creative as artists. Mm -hmm. They have to identify interesting problems, solve them in interesting ways, bring to bear all kinds of interesting tools. So I see more and more, it, it seems that these two are very similar, mm -hmm. although their reception and the cultures around them are very different. What, 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 what do you see as the core of, uh, of creativity in, in, in both of these realms? Is it a, a sense, is it self-confidence, freedom, all of those things? What, mm. what, what, what makes uh, it come together? And is it the same in both these two worlds? It's an interesting question. I mean, I went through a, a sort of a writer's block period uh, recently, and I, I experienced this real sort of just inability to come up with anything new. And it was, it was really upsetting and frustrating, and I couldn't find a way out of it. And then it kind of just uh, lifted. So I don't know what, the, um, what that thing is that just allows you to, uh, to sort of come up with something new. I think largely it has to do with a, a certain amount of um, nonconformity. Really, at the, at the point is to generally look at the way the crowd is going and start thinking, well, what if I go mm -hmm. the other way? Mm -hmm. And that, that, I think, again, is in common to both uh, engineering and art. So courage, really. Uh, Even courage though you, or foolishness? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes they go together. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, no, I think there's a certain, like, just, uh, you know, idiosyncratic way of thinking, approaching the world. And, mm -hmm. yeah, and I think it's, it sometimes can lead you into trouble, and so then you can get some people get beaten down by that. I think that, um, so the, the, the trick is a little bit of luck combined with that, um, that sort of, let's say, tendency that tends to, to make it pay off in certain cases. And then you get more confidence, and then that leads to more, more, uh, more idiosyncratic behavior. Would, would you give us an example of, of some of the robotic kinds of things that you have built, or the, the, kind of the, the the areas where these robots have applied, been applied? Well, the big area that I, I did my thesis work on was orienting parts. Mm -hmm. And so in, in factories, there's a big problem of uh, bags, parts arrive in bags and boxes, and they have to be oriented so that they can be assembled in products. And so we looked at a very fundamental problem of how could you solve that in general? And so we decided to model parts as polygons and take an, uh, an algorithmic approach to looking at the set of mechanical forces that could be applied to a polygonal object. And so there was a, a theorem that I proved as a graduate student that showed that we could orient any polygonal part with a series of very simple operations. Mm -hmm. And that led to a patent and a series of projects and different types of um, structures or, or mechanisms that could be used to orient parts. Mm -hmm. So I was interested in that. I've also been working in fixturing, which is models of holding parts for uh, machining and inspection. And more recently, I'm looking at uh, um, problems in, in automation, which mm -hmm. is how to make automation more efficient.
And, and you've also worked in the medical area because you, you actually sent me uh, a paper which uh, I must admit I could not uh, read, but on, on uh, developing uh, robotic type uh, incision, incision instruments to explore tissue for, I assume, biopsies and so on? Yes, we've been working with, with physicians at UCSF and also with researchers at Johns Hopkins on a project that involves modeling and control of um, needles, controlling needles that are used for radioactive treatment, for example, of the prostate. And the big problem there is it also a geometric problem. So we think of it somewhat as, as a robotics problem. There's uh, tumors, and they are only approximately identified with uh, medical imaging. And then the question is, how do I place, how do I deliver a radioactive dosage to the tumor and not to the healthy tissue? Mm -hmm. So there's some really nice planning problems, trying to accommodate for deformations in the tissue, et cetera. And so I have a very, very bright student who's been focusing on that over the last three years, and we have some, some nice results. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in this engineering work, we'll talk a little more about that before we get to the art, uh, it would seem that the goals are pretty clear uh, that what in, in an industrial plant you really want uh, uh, efficiency uh, and, and that goal seems to be clear uh, in, in uh, talk a little about that I mean is that is that as clear-cut as I'm trying to make it no, I've been thinking a lot about this lately. In fact, we're working, I'm working with Hubert Dreyfus, a professor of philosophy here, on a new course that we're offering in the spring called Questioning Efficiency. And we're very interested in the very idea of efficiency. What, is it, what does it mean? It's something that we all take for granted, obviously. We want to be more efficient. But it's, if you look at the, the, the roots of the, uh, of the word, it's, it's a little bit murky. It generally means that it's a ratio of the, say, energy out of a system uh, divided by the energy you put in. So thermodynamics has a model of efficiency of an engine, for example. And it always has to be less than one. But we talk about efficiency usually in terms of time. And so we want to be more efficient in uh, finishing a project and, and answering our email and various things. But there's a lot of hidden assumptions surrounding that. There are questions about the quality of the activity. And so it's not just strictly related to speed. In other words, you can be um, very fast, but not very efficient. So we're trying to really re-examine this and look back toward the history of, of of pro projects that started in the army and in the um, in prisons that were attended to control the body, to control physical motion, and how those led to our, to industrial mm -hmm. efficiency and <clears throat> to our contemporary um, tools such as the cell phone and PDAs and and car phones that are um, essentially changing the way we behave every day. Mm -hmm. So so in a way that uh, and this sort of segues into your interest in art, I think, or your night job, which we'll talk about in a second, which is that uh, an apparent goal to do a particular device and so on, once, once a, a society turns to it, can have kind of broader social implications. That is, the effect of technology generally on society uh, uh, beyond what is happening, say, on the automobile factory floor. Absolutely. I mean, many of these, uh, these technologies have interesting side effects. The one I've been thinking about lately is I, I just got a new phone. and has built in now that combines a, uh, a, an organizer, a date book, a phone, and a camera. So it's mm -hmm. convenient on one hand, so I can carry all this around in one, mm -hmm. one small package. But on the other hand, it is, um, this thing is um, really essentially allows me to pack more activity into every day. Mm -hmm. And um, it's funny, it's ringing right now, <laughs> which I didn't plan. But yeah. uh, it's. It, I, I forgot to turn my. Off. I know. <laughs> yeah. um, but the, uh, the, the. Actually, I'll, I'll turn it off right now. But the. I'll do the same. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, we'll, we'll, the audience, we're, we're demonstrating the problem that you're, uh, so we won't even have to cut that out of the video. No, we'll keep it yeah, in. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's the, that is, it's an interesting process where it's a, uh, it sort of sneaks up on you. Mm -hmm. You get this thing, you like it, it has, get, makes your life in some sense more convenient. The other side of it is, though, that it basically starts making you more and more busy. Mm -hmm. Email is another example. 
Mm -hmm. And you know, it's just, you know, my my father-in-law Leonard Schlein, uh, the great author, is uh, uh, he has he, he quoted Sophocles that nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse, mm -hmm. and that fascinates me, especially with technology. That we we really embrace all these things, but um, there's a, often si often a uh, you know consequences. Mm -hmm. So so this leads us, I guess, into your night job and, and your interest uh, in art. Uh, which is, uh, uh, how, how does that come together in a way? It, 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 it seems to be the place where you were asking those kinds of questions that you just identified a second ago. Well, the way I, I, I've been interested in art for a long time, and I mentioned when I went to, to Europe for the year abroad, I, I took art history and traveled around to, to museums, but I, I what I really like is the conceptual questions that um, that art is often very critical of the status quo and especially of technology, and so that gives me an, a chance to essentially, you know, by day develop new technology and by night question that very mm -hmm. technology. I think in some ways that uh, engineers are in a good position to do that because they understand the real potentials where there's uh, real something that's coming down the road that's that's of. Uh, that's really going to have an impact in, in five years, and we can anticipate that, and then make artwork that in some way raises questions before it's already too late. Mm -hmm. and, and an artist who's not an engineer actually does that, correct? I mean, they're, 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 their sensitivities are such that they, 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 have, they, they develop a consciousness about things that aren't apparent on the surface. And, and, and can point to the future, actually. Yes, I think what artists do, from sculptures to painters and, and, and for, for millennia, artists are attuned in a, in a, in a way to a, a longer term, bigger picture than, mm -hmm. the, than the immediate present. Mm -hmm. And so they often anticipate, um, sometimes unwittingly, um, developments of the future. And there's many great examples of that. Today, there's a lot of, of artists who are comfortable with engineering and technology, mm -hmm. who are integrating that into their work. So not only filmmakers and photographers, which of course, that's, those are forms of technology, but many artists who are using digital technology, even robots and wireless communications, et cetera, to, to in a sense, using those technologies, but at the same time questioning them. I have a quote from you which, which was attached to your exhibit at, at the Whitney, I believe, uh, media technology generally facilitates the suspension of disbelief. I'm trying to facilitate the resumption, the resumption of disbelief. So, so that, uh, that's pretty clear what you're saying and, and, and it follows from what uh, you just said. You're sort of shaking things up, shaking up our consciousness. Yes, I think what, um, thanks for quoting that, I think what, what uh, this, this question of disbelief is essentially uh, relates maybe to this whole um, perspective or attitude, which is a, a skepticism, a doubt, that I think is essential that we bring to many of the experiences we have, mm -hmm. both from things we read in the newspaper to new technologies that we're about to adopt to all kinds of environments. And at, at, at fundament, fundament, it's fundamental to the scientific method as well. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you, th this leads you to philosophy, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but, but one of the things in, in your writings that uh, uh, you talk about is the, the rejuvenation of skepticism, in a way. Now, let me, let's talk a minute about skepticism in science, because isn't it implicit in, in, in the technical work you're doing that, that generally as a way of life, people are skeptical about what you're claiming that you're doing in your scientific work, and you have to offer the proofs to meet their skepticism so science can progress, correct? Yes, but it's, it is interesting. I mean, within science and engineering, there's inherent, there should be an inherent skepticism, which mm. is that we, we always are trying to ask, okay, what, th this seems to be true. Is it really true? Will it work in all cases? When can it fail, et cetera? That's, a, I think, a very healthy um, mm. perspective. When, I'll give you one contrast between, um, mm. that, that, that I like between um, the art world and the engineering world. When a, an artist will, will say encounter, walk into a room say and see um, a paper lying on a table and it's a technical paper written by an engineer and it's filled with equations and they'll look at it and say, you know, boy, I don't understand a, a bit of this. Mm -hmm. It must be brilliant. 
Um, I mean, I can, and, and I think all engineers and scientists will tell you that there's many papers written with lots of uh, mm -hmm. with lots of equations and proofs that may be not interesting at all, mm -hmm. just because it's not really addressing a, uh, its models, its assumptions are not really realistic, or it's addressing something that's been done earlier, etc. The, the, the flip side of that is that um, the experience of an engineer wandering into an art gallery and seeing, say, some stuffed animals lying on the floor with a torn blanket. And they, often the response is, hmm, I don't understand a bit of this. Mm -hmm. It must be complete garbage. Mm -hmm. And that contrast fascinates mm -hmm. me. That mm -hmm. the, uh, the artists will often give the benefit of the doubt to the engineer but not vice versa. Mm -hmm. Now, I, this suggests something, which is that, is it the case that the I engineers and the community of engineers are in a uh, uh, an enclosed universe with, uh, of, of people who have skills and knowledge about what's being done, and therefore they can you know, look skeptically at, the, at other people's work in the way that you've just described, uh, whereas somehow what you're working with in your art colloquium and so on is people who sort of stand outside of the narrow universe and see the bigger picture either now or in the future. Is, is that part of what's going on here, basically? Well, yes. I think part of it is, though, what engineers don't often appreciate is that the art world is just as, um, as, as complex and intricate in some mm -hmm. way as the engineering or science mm -hmm. world. It has its own languages, its own history, its own nuances of uh, its own language or vocabulary, visual vocabulary, say. Mm -hmm. So that, um, you know, that those stuffed animals and that, uh, that, that you know, blanket on the ground means something if you know history of art, if you understand what it's referring to and what it's referencing. Mm -hmm. So, and that takes years of study. I mean, that's one of the biggest thing I learned which when I started working in the art world, which was, you know, I was a, it was preposterous for me to think I could just begin to make art. I had to really study and really spend a huge amount of time reading and understanding and learning this whole culture that was as as rich and, and complex as the, as what I was learning in engineering. What 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 in your background facilitate your your being able to move between these two worlds? Was were there artists in your family? Just out of curiosity. You know, I, no. Um, my mother is a, is a, is draws fairly well. Although mm -hmm. she, I've tried to encourage her, but she doesn't want to pursue. Mm -hmm. um, no, I don't know exactly. It was mm -hmm. just something that some bug that got in my ear and I couldn't get it out. Mm -hmm. Now when you started doing art, at least in, in this recent phase, I think I have a quote here from you, you decided to do it with robots. Tell us a little about that. I mean, did that make the transition easier or it was just a, an area that hadn't been developed yet? Well, so I, I had this interest in art that, w that I was I wasn't able to pursue when I was an undergrad or when I was a grad student. So when I was in, in um, finishing my graduate program, I started experimenting with painting with a robot arm. And this was uh, interesting to me that you could essentially take a big brush and dip it, have the robot dip it in ink and it could start to paint. And they, I became interested in this contrast between the kind of sterile computer art of the time, this is about mid-80s, where there were lots of computer-generated images that were completely ignored by the art world, um, largely because they didn't have any of that tactile, visceral quality. Mm -hmm. So here I could say, oh, I can regain some of that. I can put a brush and I can use materials like glass and steel uh, to, and a canvas. But what I learned was that the resulting paintings were not very interesting either. Mm. There was still a sterility and a coldness to them. And I tried to really explore that. And I became interested in Walter Benjamin and what he talks about, about that aura of a work of art. And I was trying to pursue, could we create a, a work of art that had some aura, some, some real sense of physicality? And interestingly, it wasn't just the materials. Something was missing. And trying to isolate that, trying to identify that with the robot became very fascinating to me. Even today, I, I still think that it was tremendous in, in the sense of how, how, how much it failed. Mm -hmm. and, and why? What, do, you have, do you have any further thoughts about uh, or, or, or what is your search like to find the answer to that question? Well, one thing I found was that people responded very much to the, 
to, when I did my first exhibit, which was at Carnegie Mellon in the art um, gallery there, I took a videotape of the um, robot painting, which uh, most people hadn't seen because I did this in the middle of the night when nobody was using the robot. <laughs> and uh, I put that in the back room of the gallery. Well, at the opening night, everybody was in that back room watching the videotape. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize that they didn't, the images, that I, the paintings that were all over the walls were not that compelling. But watching the, the motion of the robot was very interesting. Mm. So in a subsequent show, I brought in an industrial robot and actually had the robot painting in a gallery. And that was fascinating. People were, were very interested in seeing this robot. And of course, its movements were very you know, more lyrical. It was painting. And so we lit it with, with lights and shadow. So that physicality became much more interesting. And that's been, so it's been an evolution where I've tried to understand what is, what is really engaging about these, these kinds of, of installations. So, so in a way, it, it sounds like that the, the paintings were too sterile, but the, the, the seeing the, the kind of human, poss potential humanness of the robot actually doing the thing m m created a larger canvas which was the work of art is, is that what you're saying exactly yeah, yeah. we saw I, I i mean it was it sort of stumbled on it but it wasn't what i expected mm -hmm. um that that um the and I, now your, your earlier question i don't i still don't know exactly why the paintings failed probably largely because i i just wasn't good enough to make interesting ones but i think there was also something that they they were not the the robot just lacked a kind of inherent human quality now, I still think that it, w it wasn't human, what people were, were fascinated by watching the, the robot. But they, they were very interested in this idea of the motion, the repetitive motion of mm. the arm and the gracefulness of a, of, a, of a machine. I still find it fascinating, by the way, when I go to a construction site, just mm -hmm. watching these big machines moving around. Little kids. The same is true with little kids. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah it's, it's hypnotic. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that led to starting to think more about actually letting people control the robots themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, we're, let, let's talk. I, I want to show your book uh, called The Robot in the Garden. Uh, and uh, one of your first exhibits uh, was a uh, uh, this... Uh, uh, installation. Uh, talk a little about that. And by the way, I should mention, you were really the first uh, person, I believe, to activate a robot, or, I mean, to, to, to control a robot through the internet. Is that, am I correct in that? Or? Well, we get credit for the first internet robot. Yeah, so th it, there's many different ways that yeah. that could be defined. Okay. The idea of telerobotics has a very long history. Yeah, no, that I understand. Yeah, okay. okay. So, um, but yeah, controlling robots over, over an internet, the, the a particular feature of that that's, that's really new is that, you, that anyone can, can, can participate. Mm -hmm. So we made a robot in 1994, right around the early days of the, of the, of the web, that, uh, that anyone could log into and they could control the arm. And we set this up over a sandbox. We buried a bunch of little miniature objects in there and we set up a story that it was about an archaeological dig. And so people could come in and they could blow sand in the air blow air in the sand to essentially do archaeology over a distance. And we were totally unprepared by the response. Mm -hmm. We were getting hundreds and then thousands of people coming in a day. Mm -hmm. And the robot was online 24 hours. And in fact, um, on, on Monday morning, we'd come in and all the sand would have been blown <laughs> over to one side of the uh, <laughs> sandbox. So it was very interesting to me because it was a way to take an art installation and essentially reach a very large audience. And mm -hmm. had, I mean, when you do an installation in a gallery, it's a very limited uh, opening hours mm -hmm. and usually a very limited exhibition period. But here over the net, you could, you could put an installation up that could stay up months or years. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the robot in the garden and, and, and please tell us about your original intention which wasn't, uh, 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 the, the consequence wasn't what you thought once you created the... Right, the, the, it was another case where I started along one yeah. line and ended up on another. Yeah. Well, in this case, the, um, the first project, the Mercury project with the robot um, and the sandbox was, was successful. So we, we received some funding to make an, a second project. And we thought, my students and I and uh, colleagues at, at USC, we started thinking, well, what would be a good... Um, sequel to that. And we thought, well, since we're, the first project was hunting and gathering, if you will, that it made a natural sense to move into, take the evolutionary step into agriculture. So we thought, let's build a garden. And we'll allow people over the internet to come in and um, with the robot 
to move around, move a camera through the garden to look, but also to um, water the plants and then plant their own seeds. Now, as an art project, it was also meant as the sort of most absurd application we could imagine. Namely, the last thing we, we thought you really want to do at, over the internet is garden. <laughs> I mean, it's a very physical, mm -hmm. visceral mm -hmm. thing. And so we were, you know, there was a dual, this is really demonstrates both sides of these. I mean, a lot of people um, came to the project thinking, oh, this is the future of gardening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to us, that was the, it, just the opposite. It, mm -hmm. was, it was sort of a, a somewhat of a, 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 a criticism, a critique of the internet. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, this is very interesting because essentially you, uh, as a technologist, you built something and a community of ecology-minded people were drawn to it and be, began responding to it as an ecological event and they were communicating with each other and so on. So at one level, even though this wasn't your original intention, it demonstrated what the potential of technology becoming the, the, the servant of a particular community. Is that mm. a fair analysis? Yes, and actually it's, that's right on target, Harry. One of the things that I, I think we've learned is that these projects, there's a, um, um, the, the, first of all, I'm very interested in the idea of technology and nature and the juxtaposition or the, mm -hmm. the confrontation of those two. So setting up projects that involve nature um, directly. But the social element is always fascinating and, 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 and surprising. What will people do with these systems? And in this case, one of the things we found with, the, uh, with the, both the Mercury Project and the tele Telegarden was an, another effect that we didn't anticipate, which was um, certain, we got certain emails um, from, from participants asking whether or not there was a real garden. Mm -hmm. And the first time I, we, we got this, I'll never forget, I, I get this email and I thought, you know, it was so obvious because I was sitting right next to it. But, <laughs> um, but I realized, I started thinking, well, how, how could, I, how could they, that person know? And it wouldn't be too difficult to fake it. Namely, you could take a, go out to a, you know, forget it, you, there is no robot. You just take a camera and place it around, pre-store a lot of images, pre-store images before watering and after watering, et cetera. So you do this elaborate, essentially, hoax, mm -hmm. which is, and on the internet, would be indistinguishable. So I became interested in that perceptive process about, well, what are you, what would someone experience and how would they know um, reality from fiction? And that question is really a very old question. Mm -hmm. uh, and and this, is, this is the kind of uh, problem, a new problem, it was unexpected, that led you into a further journey in your career, which is back to philosophy. Maybe you had already been to philosophy, but, but to look at uh, big picture questions that philosophers have and are addressing about, well, what does it mean when you know something and you're knowing it from a distance. Mm -hmm. Right, well one of the great things about coming to Berkeley, I, I have to say, is that there, this, as you know, this, uh, this campus is just filled with brilliant, creative individuals. And the, the, the nice thing is that their doors are generally open. And when I arrived here, one of the first people I looked up was uh, one of my heroes, Hubert Dreyfus. And we, he was very generous and, um, and open. And we, we, we started talking about some of the projects I, I was working on. And I told him about this conundrum. Um, I think I had, I had come up with this, um, with this term, telepistemology. Um, and he was very supportive of that. I, I mean, it was somewhat absurd for, for an engineer to sort of coin a, 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 to really raise a philosophical question. But he said, in, in a sense, that, that it was an interesting philosophical question, that epistemology, which has roots going back to, the, to Plato and the Greeks, the question of knowledge, the, what, what is knowledge, what counts as knowledge, what can we know, has been wrestled with for, for centuries. And the, the question changes very dramatically around the time of Descartes with the development of scientific instruments like the microscope and telescope that really caused us to to, to begin to doubt our natural perceptive abilities. So when one day it was discovered that there's all kinds of creatures walking on our hand, 
that we can't see, but they're there, really caused a fundamental shift that mm -hmm. leads to this very skepticism we talked about earlier that leads into the whole scientific method. Mm -hmm. So what we were asking was whether or not uh, the internet could lead to a, an analogous um, shift or, or at least to reinvigorate the same question that Descartes asked. Descartes asked, how do I know anything? How do I know I'm sitting here having this interview with Harry Chrysler and not dreaming it? And, and, and today we say, oh, well, there's, we, 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 you know, we can tell the difference between a dream and reality and hallucination, etc. But the internet, things aren't so clear. You can be sitting there very actively tending a garden, spending weeks and months getting very attached to your plants, mm -hmm. and then turn out that it's, there is no garden. One, one of your authors uses the term telepresence. So basically what you're saying, that these different kinds of technology, the internet being the most advanced, they, they allow us through technical means to be present in a place where we may not physically be present. And, and that's where all of these problems of knowing uh, come to be put on the table. Yeah, so telepresence is an interesting term. I mean, it, it's, it, it means that, you know, at a distance, to be present somewhere at a distance. So, you know, one, one extreme you might say, well, when I'm reading a book, I can get transported, and so I'm present in the Middle Ages or something like that. So, uh, at one extreme. Or when I'm watching a, a film, I become so engrossed in that, I, I'm, I'm completely unaware of my environment or what, I'm sitting on something uncomfortable, mm. an, an uncomfortable chair. But when, um, and, and another example is, is a telephone. Um, we, we use this every day. In fact, it's very interesting that we can drive a car very happily through traffic and very complex situation and yet be carrying on a, a very nuanced conversation with somebody. So, you know, where are we when that's happening? Mm -hmm. Now, now give us exam. So, so you're you're learning all of this stuff. You've you've moved into art in a big way, uh, and uh, you're 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 now an artist by night, to use your term. So, so give us some examples of uh, uh, projects that you've done. I, I know one was a Ouija board, yeah. I believe. And, and 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 so so briefly tell us about one or two of them, and then how they are furthering the problems that, that you become interested in because of this, this night job. Okay, well I'll tell you, the, the two, the, you mentioned the Ouija board. So that was a project we did for uh, right around the, the turn of the century. So there was a lot of concerns, as you remember, about Y2K, where all the computers going to break down. And uh, the sort of millennial fears are actually very um, fascinating. They, they, they occur every time there's a, there's a new century. And we started looking back at the, the turn of the, the, the 19th century to the 20th century. And at that time, there was a development of radio and telephone. Hmm. And so those were the technologies of the time. But um, people were also very fascinated with mediums and spirituality, you know, contacting the dead. Um, so things like Ouija boards originated hmm. around that same time. Hmm. Now, if you think about it, it wasn't so far-fetched that if we suddenly were able to pick up this, you know, telephone and speak with someone, some distant and unseen person. It wasn't such a stretch to think that you could use some other mechanism to contact the dead. So we, were, we started to think of the Ouija board as an interesting metaphor for technologies and how they were changing perception. And at the same time, somewhat of a, a critique of the internet. Um, so, you know, sort of, we wanted something that would be fun, a sort of game. And so we set up a robotic Ouija board. And what that was was you could log in from anywhere in the world, and there was a, a sign, that there, was a, there was a display that explained how you were supposed to turn off the lights in your office, and then move the keyboard away from your display, put your mouse and your mouse pad in front of the display, <laughs> then you click a button and you place your hands on top of the mouse. Mm -hmm. So that mouse then, microscopic motions of the mouse were then captured in your computer, transmitted back to our server in our lab, and then the, command, the motion of your mouse and everyone else who was playing at that time is then used to drive a robot arm. <laughs> so you're actually, in a way, playing the Ouija with people all over the world. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and that was very interesting sort of for us of a way of um, playing with this idea of the subconscious interaction of people, the belief in some, some kind of supernatural. Um, and, and of course then just in sort of telepistemological questions of you know, how do you know if there's anybody actually playing or if we're simulating that or if we're actually taking into account your 
movements or if there's even a robot there at all. Mm -hmm. Now you said there was another project. Tell us about one other project, one other art project. So the other one is more very recent. We, the, our work with robotic arms also led us to an interest in robotic cameras. And we discovered that since 9-11, there's been a whole a number of new commercial products out. Very high-powered robotic cameras have emerged. These are commercially available, relatively low in cost, about $1,000. We, we found one of these cameras that could zoom in 22x optical zoom. Mm -hmm. Now that's very powerful. So we decided to do a project in artwork for um, the, in, in simultaneous with the anniversary of the free speech movement, where we would use that camera to, to raise questions about privacy. And essentially by placing the camera over Sproul Plaza, which is where the free speech movement originated in 1964, mm. So this was time to, to be exactly at the, the, the anniversary of the student protest, um, October of 1964. Now it was 2004, so 40 years later. We, we got permission from the students, student union to put this up on the top of the Martin Luther King building. So it's on the fifth floor. It's in a small glass dome. And the, the camera has the capability to look all the way down um, Telegraph Avenue, all the way through the, the uh, okay. yes, and, and into <laughs> Zellerbach. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and across campus, and, and so uh, and then it could zoom in with enough power to to look at the book that you're holding in your hands. So we put this on the internet with another feature, which is that people anyone could log in at any time, and they could control the camera by zooming, and they could also um, snap pictures, and and write captions about the pictures. And the idea was we wanted to create a dialogue between participants. We wanted to see how people would react, essentially, to being put in the position of the voyeur. Um, because these security cameras, I think we're, we're, we're taking them for granted. But we don't often get to see what it looks like from the other side, how potent they are. And as, as you can imagine, it created a, a somewhat of a controversy here on campus. Mm -hmm. so, so in a way, the, the art uh, is potentially is both a political statement and offers the potential for elevating political consciousness. We're, well, we hope so. I mean, one of the things that came out of this was there was um, some real concern about the administration, and I think justifiably. You uh, mean the, 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 the uh, presidential administration, the Bush administration? Well, that too, but no, no we got we, called we, in by, uh, the, uh, uh, by the chancellor. I see, I yeah. see. Oh, OK. Um, the chancellor, the vice chancellor, the, um, the, the head of legal affairs, mm. academic senate. I mean, there was very serious, and they took it seriously, and I respect them for that. And they, they, they said, well, you know, what are the consequences of this, such a mm. camera? There had been a camera, a webcam, out over Sparrow Plaza for five years or so. Nobody blinked. Mm -hmm. What was different about this one was it had the ability to zoom much more, in, much further. So as an engineer, I became interested, well, if a camera here is OK, and a camera here is not OK, mm -hmm. well, what's the, what number of zoom mm -hmm. is OK? Where does it cross the line? And it, it, it's not clear, but it, very, it was definitely clear that, that our camera was too close for comfort. Mm -hmm. So we were asked to reduce the zoom, which we did. But we, we, um, we, we put the, left the camera online for six weeks and collected all kinds of photographs. In fact, there's an archive now. Mm -hmm. Online. You, online, you? yeah. If you go to, to, on Google, if you, if you type demonstrate, mm -hmm. it usually comes up first. And what that is is a, an archive of, of what the, the kinds of images that were taken um, mm -hmm. by strangers, uh, people all over campus, of the campus itself, by people who, in many cases, knew, some cases knew, other cases didn't know that there was a camera. And in a way, it's tried to raise awareness of these cameras. Of course, now, since in the, in, in, in the year since, the, the events with London and the bombings and the, and the subways and buses have led to a proliferation of cameras. Um, in, in the UK, there's four million mm -hmm. surveillance cameras set up on street corners. Um, now they're starting to discuss the same here in the US. And there's very little opposition. And I think it's important that people consider what's at stake with, with installing these cameras. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because what your, the, the two aspects of your career, we'll call being an artist part of your career, that, that in, in, there is a, a really, sounds like a really important dialogue going on. Because engineers generally 
are producing all sorts of technology that can be used uh, by both well-intentioned and malintentioned people. Uh, sometimes it's just a question of power. That once you get the power, you do it. But the, on the other side, you're, uh, you're playing with uses of the technology which, whether you intend it or not, can shock people mm -hmm. into thinking about the meaning, all of this. So it's a, it sounds to me like a fascinating uh, dialogue going on inside of your head with, with, very, uh, with broader implications for society. Well, and I'm interested in, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Power is, is there is a kind of power of technology or of, a, of uh, I think what engineers often, you know, don't, um, don't recognize, but they do have an enormous power in terms of things they, they may, we, we may take for granted, which is, you know, that we can put together certain kinds of systems. And we were fascinated by the, the capability of the systems, but their implications can oftentimes catch us off guard. And to my mind, that's um, the, the most interesting thing about these um, uh, doing art installations is that I really see them as experiments. When we put them out there, we don't know how they're going to mm. turn out. Mm. So, so in a way, it's, it's you're, you're getting a kind of an audience response. So that, that in other words, you're, <clears throat> you're placing the technology somewhere where some community or some subset of community can respond uh, to what you're doing, wherein you, as an artist who happens to be an engineer, are learning things that you hadn't known before just as an engineer. I think that's, that's extremely well put. Yeah. Now, when I read all of this, uh, I was fascinated by the implications for uh, what you're saying for essentially the war on terrorism because one can think of uh, robotic type devices that we're using in bombing campaigns where it's controlled by the state. The, 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 the military has a notion of a battlefield warfare where people with computers are seeing things and directing flights from you know the United States to come and bomb uh, 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 you know, on the battlefield, on, on the one hand, the terrorists themselves also are really clearly into telepresence in the sense that they're manipulating images to, to, to shape the politics. And then all the questions you just raised about uh, surveillance, privacy, and national security. So how does, uh, some of these questions you're not addressing, but, but I know you are addressing the questions of, of privacy and surveillance in, in a committee that you're now involved in. Tell us a little about that. Well, you, you're right. I mean, the, I think the, these questions in, in the broader picture of, um, of, of, of military and warfare are actually very old questions, that action at a distance is really uh, at the root of many kinds of weapons. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're, they're very complex, and the military is moving much more toward robotic um, devices, um, planes and um, cameras. And you're right, on, on both sides, there's a great deal of uh, use, for example, of cell phones as detonators. Um, the Closer to home, the idea of the, the surveillance question, the camera project that we did demonstrate was um, w one outcome of that, which w was the, uh, the chancellor's meeting, was we were asked to form a committee to investigate the, the, the legal and the sort of policy questions around cameras on, on campus. Mm. So the first thing we did was looked around at other campuses for what are their policies. And amazingly, there's very little. Mm. Um, we have some policies within the Committee on Human Subjects here, but we talk with them and they they, very clearly, those are limited to research projects. Um, we also talked to the um, campus security. They have some policies on cameras, but those are limited to um, security um, applications. But there's a, a third category that is people just wanting to put cameras up for promotion, PR, entertainment, et cetera. And currently, there's no policy about that. So any student can put a camera up outside his or her dorm and, and, uh, and, and you know, it can be made available over the internet, et cetera. So you know, should we have a policy? And one of the things we, we, we came to, we formed this, this um, committee with um, representatives from art history, philosophy, 
film studies, a, a variety of different areas, law. Uh, uh, Deirdre Mulligan from the law school is very active. And one of the things we um, came to was a proposal of at least the beginnings of a policy, which is simply that there should be a central uh, repository of information about cameras. So that cameras can be essentially listed on a web page. And for each camera, it would describe something about who's responsible, who owns it, mm -hmm. and you know, who to contact if you have a problem with it. And that's at least, a, I think, a, a fair thing to ask. So if a camera comes up that's not, if you spot a camera that's not on that uh, list, you have a right to ask, OK, well, you know, it needs to be registered. The second question is, well, once it's registered, you know, is it authorized, et cetera? That's more complicated. And for example, the security office doesn't want to take responsibility mm -hmm. for all cameras all over campus. Mm -hmm. So we're just at the beginning of this discussion, but we've been talking with some other campuses, and I think there's an opportunity for, for Berkeley to really um, to set an example. You, it's interesting because one, one of the things you said, or something that I read that you said about the excitement of being at Berkeley and this kind of interdisciplinary thing, but you're, you're really identifying a way in which we, Berkeley is at the threshold of the innovation in technology and kind of understanding the social consequences and uh, trying to deal with it. It's, it's quite fascinating because I don't think you had any idea of all these repercussions because you wanted to do this, this art installation on uh, the plaza in honor of the free speech movement. Well, no, and we were somewhat, I mean, we knew we were, we were, we were pushing those boundaries, but some of the scenarios that were raised by the, by the um, but by Deirdre and, and her students in the law school were things we hadn't anticipated. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, one of the great things here, and there's a couple new programs, um, the Center for New Media, which is just being developed here on campus as faculty from 30 different departments. But looking at new media, in particular things like um, surveillance cameras, games, new technologies, even things like PowerPoint, mm -hmm. and asking what are the implications of those kind of technologies on our experience, our perception, um, on teaching, and, and, and it's drawing them from all these disciplines. So we have these really nice new projects that are, that are developing from this kind of cross-fertilization of faculty across departments. Mm -hmm. so, so tell us, you know, uh, we're coming to the end of the interview, but I'm curious, what have all, has all this activity, your work as an engineer, your work as an artist, your development of this colloquium on art and technology, uh, how has it affected you in, uh, in understanding where truth can be found in, in this world that you're working in, namely the world of, of telepresence? Are you more comfortable now? What, what insights have you gained <laughs> about Clearly, it's a long journey, and there are no definitive answers yet. But uh, any thoughts and anything that you now know that you didn't know a few years ago because of all of this this artistic and mm -hmm. colloquium kind of activity? Well, it's a it's a great question. I mean, I, I I'd have to think about that. I I mean, I've learned an enormous amount, and in one of the um, the the biggest thing I think is that. You know, and I didn't mention, but my wife, Tiffany Schlein, is a, the founder of the Webby Awards. Mm -hmm. And so she's very involved in technologies and, and, and its cultural imp impact. Um, she's also a filmmaker, so I'm working with her on a film project right now. And our, the, the project that we did that I'm, prob that I'm most proud of is uh, we have a daughter. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> Odessa is, uh, is, is a little over two right now. And I'm learning an enormous amount from her. Mm -hmm. just in her perception and how she starts to acquire a models of the world and experiment and and tease and a sense of humor and all of those things i mean we've been i've been playing with robots for for 20 years but i it's complete there's a completely new terrain here with uh with a child mm -hmm. and and do you do you uh uh is is the ultimate goal to somehow that these will come together in the future? Not, not that we will have robots that are children, but rather that the, the robots will draw on some of the things that we know about our own humanity. I, I think Dreyfus talks about that in the essay, the notion that we will, that in, in the search for truth, it's coming 
to the human recognition of other people in a context that really informs whether we know what we know. Well, I think the thing we learn in robotics is we get a, the more we try to do recreate human capabilities, like the ability to pick up a glass, to walk across a room, to, uh, to, to, to navigate any kind of complex social environment. The more we try and recreate that with the robot, the more we essentially appreciate how, how amazing it is for humans to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things we're learning with these kind of technologies is the things that, that we can't do with technology. And I, I'm, I'm still on the side of that, in a sense I'm rooting that there's things we aren't, we're not going to be able to figure out. I mean, the, the fact that we still don't understand, really, about, very much about language understanding, about um, physical perception, etc., I, I take some heart in that. Um, I, was, I was disappointed that, 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 ro that computers can now play chess better, <laughs> better than Kasparov. But I do think that there's, we're, we're, it, computers were certainly advanced, and there's going to be lots of, of great discoveries. But I think there's always going to be some, hopefully, some pocket of things that are going to be uniquely human. Ken, on, on that uh, positive note uh, for humanity, I, I want to thank you for taking the time to come to the studio and do this interview. Thank you, Harry. And good luck in, in your colloquium, which I know is going to be continuing in the fall. Yes, thanks. Good. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.